Dominic Steele and today the clarity, truthfulness, sufficiency and efficacy of scripture. We're talking about the Bible with Mark Thompson, the uh, principal of Moore Theological College in Sydney. Um, what is the character of scripture? One list I read in Dr. Thompson's new book, this, The Doctrine of Scripture, an introduction, has authority, truth, integrity, sanctity, perspicuity, perfection or sufficiency, necessity and efficacy. Um, well, Mark Thompson has narrowed it down though to four and um, you focus on just four words. Um, uh, can you talk to me, Mark, about your pastor's heart and what caused you to write this book on the doctrine of scripture? Well, thanks, Dominic. Um, I've been interested in the Doctrine of Scripture for a long Forever. time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It seems to me everything I write is on the Doctrine of Scripture. But um, one of the reasons is that I see that so much that's going on in churches mm. really resolves down to, are we going to take God's Word as a good word? Are we going to believe it, trust it and follow it? Um, and particularly, are we going to see that this Word is not something you can separate out from Jesus? Now, mm. I hear people from time to time saying to me that I'm a follower of Jesus, but I don't believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, I read people write things like, we follow Jesus, not a book. Mm -hmm. And you separate out then Jesus from the Bible. And mm -hmm. what I wanted to do, particularly in writing this book, was to say, that's really not something that you can do. Uh, following Jesus means taking the Bible seriously because Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And being a disciple of Jesus means you have the same attitude mm. towards the Bible as Jesus had. Mm. So throughout the book, one of the main things I'm trying to do is to constantly bring us back to Jesus mm. so that we don't have the doctrine of Scripture over here and Jesus over there somewhere. Yeah, I mean, that was a surprise for me. I mean, you, you opened by talking about the Lord Jesus. And, yes. um, uh, and what was his attitude to Scripture? Well, what was it? <laughs> well, uh, you have a look at the way in which Jesus used the Old Testament, which is the Bible of mm -hmm. his time, and, and the way in which he commissioned the New Testament. Mm -hmm. He gave um, his apostles uh, a mission to take to the end of the age, to the end of the world. So that's eventually going to give us the New Testament. So Jesus sort of stands in the middle of the Bible as the one who endorses the Old Testament and commissions the New Testament. But his use of the Bible in his own time is really informative, mm. I think. Because he goes to the Bible to tell people what he is like, who, is, who he is, what his mission is. So he's constantly referring back to the promises in the Old Testament and how he fulfills them. When he's faced with challenge, whether it be by um, the devil in the wilderness mm -hmm. or by the Pharisees, his appeal is to Haven't you the read? Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah, have you not read? You know, uh, And it's interesting that then you see that same dynamic of how do we explain the gospel? We go to God's word and see the promises fulfilled. It's exactly what you see in the writings of the apostles who are following the example of Jesus and saying, this is what has happened. And you need to understand that in the light of what's God, what God has told us in the Old Testament. One of the things that I don't think I'd reflected on before uh, was just uh, you pointed out that Jesus goes to the precision of the Old Testament and uh, whether the tense or the exact meaning of the word, just going to unpack that for us? Yeah, there's a, there are a couple of um, um, occasions in which Jesus actually quotes words and then says to uh, his opponents, you are trying to discount the word of God by what you're doing with your tradition, mm -hmm. which again says he sees the Old Testament as the word of God. But it will go more than just generally thinking about what the message of the Old Testament is, right down to the position of, he said you are gods. And he uses the very expressions, the words of the psalm. So now, what does that mean? And, mean, and then explains. But he, um, he is taking us to not just a general thought about the Old Testament, but the exact words that are written. Why? So I take it he sees these words are words that God has given us. Mm. Yeah. You had a quote from uh, Van Hooser. Mm. If God does not speak, he does not command, bless, promise or warn. But more devastating than that, if God does not speak, he does not covenant. Yes. Or well, does not make, uh, and I would think covenant and promises mm. are bind carefully together. I think a covenant is a way in which you express a promise in mm -hmm. a particular context. But if God doesn't speak, if he's some mute mm. force in the universe, then those promises are just the imaginations of religious people in the past. Mm. But no, these are promises. This is what God says he will do. And so when Jesus comes along 
and he is the fulfillment of every promise in the Old Testament. You can see that God has had from the very beginning this plan of saving people. And he hasn't left us in the dark to try and figure it out for ourselves. He has instead given us a clear word, a word that makes sense, a word that um, actually will make a difference. Why was it necessary? I'm just thinking about now the necessity of, mm. of um, uh, the doctrine of Scripture. Um, why was it necessary for the spoken word to become written word? Um, I think that's a great question. And I think the, uh, the reason why, <coughs> and lots has been written mm. on this, this question of the necessity of Scripture, is so that we might have a record of what God has said. Um, particularly as you move beyond the time when God's uh, direct dealings with Israel, when you move beyond the time when Jesus' earthly ministry to a diffuse Christian ministry in the whole world, how do you know that what you have and what you believe is actually the Word of God? Well, God has given us a written word to trust. His, his, his written word is his spoken word uh, put down in words for us to be able to take to the ends of the earth. Now, the thing I think is interesting and which I try and point out a little bit in the book is the decision to put God's spoken words in writing is not actually a human decision, first and foremost. Mm. The person who makes that transition from spoken word to written word is God himself. And you, we talk about the Ten Commandments mm. that are written with the finger of God. That is, that God actually produces a written word. And I think uh, one of the most um, interesting um, expositions of that and the, and the importance of that comes with Joshua when Moses dies. Because God had been physically present, been with, spiritually but physically present with Moses. So Moses speaks to God face to face as a, as a man speaks to his friend, we're told. And God promises Joshua on Moses' death, I will be with you as I was with Moses. But then he says to him, pay attention to this book of the law. Meditate upon it. Uh, don't move from it from the right or to the left. So having God present with him doesn't do away with this written word. Why? Because God wants the dynamic of his life to be shaped by the words that he has already spoken. And so that's rather than looking for new words, he's to take seriously the word God has already given. I take it that's the dynamic that we need to learn from. Hmm. Now, <laughs> you got into a section on the formation of the canon. And I thought, oh, it's ages since I've thought about the formation of the canon. And I have my own little 60 second answer for when I get Good. that question. But um, I just thought, uh, what's your 60 second answer when a layman comes to you and says, because you used what, the technical term messy. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's right. <laughs> Historically, it's messy. Uh, it is messy because you have a look and see that um, not every church in the Mediterranean area um, had access to all of Paul's letters early on. Mm. Uh, we know, because Paul said this to the Colossians, once they read his letter, once he, they were to go and share it with the church at Laodicea, and they were to read the letter that he wrote to Laodicea. So Paul expected his letters to be written, uh, to be read and passed around. But they didn't get everywhere. And so some places didn't know that Paul had written this letter or that mm. letter. It, it gets a little bit messy like that. But that there was a canon is not something that happens or is decided upon in the third or fourth century. The Christian church emerges with a canon consciousness right from the very beginning. That starts with the Old Testament. They already know that they have a collection of writings which are the word of God to his people. Mm -hmm. uh, but then as the New Testament emerges, it becomes clear that those writings, the writings of God's um, appointed Apostles, Christ's appointed apostles, are uh, put alongside the Old Testament as explaining the fulfillment of those promises. So Peter speaks about Paul's writings as uh, people twist these like they do the other scriptures. Mm. So he recognises already that Paul's writings are significant. We know by the end of the first century and perhaps much earlier um, that the Gospels were circulating. Firstly, independently, then as a collection of four Gospels, um, and then eventually they, um, they come together with the epistles to form the New Testament. But, uh, so we know those writings are there. But the historical process of people coming to know all that has been written and recognising that these are the writings and no others is a messy sort of process. 
But behind that mess is the one secure truth, I think, and that is uh, Jesus endorsed the Old Testament. He spoke of the law, the prophets and the Psalms, which is the threefold um, division of the Hebrew Bible. But he also commissioned his apostles to take his message to the ends of the earth. He gave particular authority to his apostles. And so it's the connection to the apostles and their ministry, which is what gives the New Testament its authority and why it sits together alongside the Old Testament, uh, because they are Christ's apostles and they're taking his words and uh, his message to the nations. Now, you, your big word or your first big word of the big four was clarity or mm -hmm. scripture yeah, sure. is clear. And uh, as I read that, I thought, ah, and immediately I went to a Facebook debate that I'd followed um, where somebody had written on Facebook, um, anyone who says scripture is clear is a goose, you know. Or they, must they had be a, a goose then. They, oh, yeah, had, a, they had a different term to that, but uh, or it, you, you, you can't make that statement. And so, but, but then you gave quite a nuanced answer about what you meant by scripture mm. is clear. So what do you mean when you say scripture is clear? Well, I want to start, as you need to start, I think, with every one of the characteristics of Scripture in remembering that Scripture is God's Word. Mm -hmm. And so it bears, it, it reflects upon the character of God. And so when I speak about clarity, I usually start with saying God is very good at communicating. Um, he's not deceived. He's not um, uh, ignorant. Uh, and he's not ineffective as a communicator. And so when God has a word to say to us, he makes his word accessible. Now, the, the issue for us is that we confuse clarity and simplicity. To suggest that the Bible is clear is not to say that it's the same thing as being simple. Um, it is clear in that God has made accessible his mind. He hasn't told us everything. But what he has told us is enough for us to know how to live as his people in our world, right? And in order for that to be um, effective, it needs to be clear. So when Jesus, for instance, um, says to the Pharisees, have you not read? That whole question would make no sense if the Bible wasn't clear. Mm. He says, have you not read? He expects them to not only have read it, but understood it. And his challenge to their behaviour is because their behaviour is out of step with what the Bible teaches. So Jesus actually evidently thought that the Old Testament was sufficiently clear for people to know how to live as God's person. I mean, actually, you quoted Deuteronomy 30, I think, yeah. saying um, this command is not too hard for you to understand. Uh, that's <laughs> right. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't hard parts. Um, I think it's great fun that the that. Uh, Peter could say of Paul that there are some parts in Paul that are, that are hard, hard. <laughs> hard to understand. Now, he doesn't say they're impossible to understand, but they're hard to understand. And I think our difficulties he arise... He must have been thinking of Romans too. He, he <laughs> might have been. But part of the difficulty is, you know, we're remote from the language, yeah. we're remote from the culture, uh, there are lots... Of, and we're not as familiar with the whole. Yeah. And as we become more familiar with the whole of the Bible, the, uh, the parts become clearer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not the same as illumination? No, I think illumination is the work of the Spirit to enlighten our minds, to enable us to not only hear, but to believe what's written. So that's the work of the Spirit in us. I want to say there's no problem with the text. The problem is with us. With my heart. And so I need the work of the Spirit to enlighten my mind and to soften my heart to the Word of God. And that is what God promises to do. Um, to write his law on our hearts, etc. So that illuminating process is something that's done to us rather than to the word. Um, my, one of my favourite theologians you'll know is Martin Luther. And Martin Luther... <laughs> he gets quite a few... <laughs> he gets a, a few he runs, runs in his book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully not too many, but he does get a few. Uh, and one, one of the things that Luther said was, you know, there are two sorts of clarity, really. There's... Clarity, the external clarity of the Bible, it just makes sense. God hasn't written gobbledygook. Mm -hmm. uh, if you understand the context in which it's written, if you pay attention to the words... Did you really say written, gobbledygook? No, no, I don't think he used that. He'd use some German equivalent, right. no doubt. <laughs> or knowing Luther would probably be a bit, a bit more colourful than that. Yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it's, 
he hasn't made it unaccessible in that sort of way. He's actually hasn't said nonsense. He said something that can be understood if you put it in its proper context, yeah. read it. The way in which we tend to read you know, most things, you know, most of our written communication succeeds. 99% you know, of written communication in the world succeeds. Um, so why we would think that God's communication would be, succeed, wouldn't yeah. succeed, I don't know. But so it succeeds. But the problem is a problem in the human heart. And so internal clarity, that conviction about its truthfulness and putting it into practice, that work of the Spirit um, is, that's illumination, I mm. think, is internal clarity and illumination go side by side. There's been massive debates around the second of your big words, truth. And yes. um, your word is truth over the last couple of yeah. centuries. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you, once again, I go back to Jesus. Does Jesus treat the Old Testament as true? He treats, he doesn't think Jonah is an imaginary character. He actually says that. No, uh, he, do, he doesn't, does he? No, no. As far, you know, Jonah did this. And precisely because he did this, he's going to stand up on the last day and condemn this generation, Jesus says, because something greater than Jonah is here. Um, now, so he, he treats the Old Testament as true, and therefore we have confidence to treat the Old Testament as true. I think, I, I, I have no problem with the old uh, word inerrancy, meaning without error. Um, the problem is you can hold that word and pretend you have a high view of the Bible and you don't because the real question is not whether you think it's true the real question is whether you're going to obey it now you might obey it you obey it because you know that it's true um, but it's not assenting to the truthfulness of scripture that says that you've got a biblical doctrine of scripture it's whether you will take it seriously as the word of God and live out what you hear so I want to affirm the truthfulness of scripture without making it the big thing that co covers everything else some people want to if you like, quarantine the word truth to particular parts of Scripture yeah. while kind of giving lip service to truthful to the whole thing. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, a difficult position to hold in the end um, because... Although there are many are who hold it. There are many who hold it indeed. Yeah. Um, but I think in the end you want to say truth is not just about propositions. So is the parable of the prodigal son true it's not a propositional argument it's a story mm -hmm. but the story of the prodigal son teaches a lesson when understood in its context why Jesus told the story which is clear in the text itself um, there is a message that the psalm that the, that the parable sorry is is telling that parable is the meaning of that parable is true I don't have to go looking around for who is that father or who Where are those that pigs die? <laughs> yeah, where the pigs die, who are the two sons and those I don't need to 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 pursue those questions in order to know that what Jesus was saying about God's heart, welcoming and uh, reaching out to the lost and challenging the Pharisees because they did not have the heart of the God they were invoking, um, that, that message is true. And it's a message that challenges me too. So how does precision play into that? Um, I think there are a range of things. We've got to look at the way the we, we sometimes look back as 21st century people and expect that the Bible will be written the way I would write a doctoral thesis or an, or an essay mm. or something like that. Careful, logical, um, appeal to argument that's footnoted and everything's accurate, etc. The Bible uses hyperbole. Jesus uses hyperbole. It uses phenomenological language, by which I mean um, the Bible speaks about the sun rising mm. and the four corners of the earth without endorsing a flat earth or without endorsing a, um, you know, a geocentric view of the universe. Mm -hmm. you know, that's just the way we perceive it. The sun looks to us like it's rising. That's a phenomenological description. So it uses phenomenological descriptions, it uses hyperbole, it uses all sorts of figurative language. Um, and those things, I think, um, need to be taken into account. You need to, and you do that in ordinary other ways in which you read. So we adjust the way we read when we know the context of the thing that we're receiving. So I get a note from my daughter saying, Dad, please, can I have the car keys? 
something we've had a conversation <laughs> earlier about cars. Um, yeah. Just been discussing <laughs> children and borrowing cars. <laughs> so I get a note from my daughter. I, I read that and I understand that. I don't start picking that apart in the way I might if I was reading an academic article. I read the newspaper differently to the way I read a love letter from my wife because yeah. I understand the context of it. We do that all the time. So when we come to the Bible, understanding that Jesus is telling a story at this point, so under, technically scholars would say understanding the genre of mm. the writing that you're reading, understanding the context, why it was written, into what point of time it was written, understanding how it fits into the whole, mm. You know, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a coherent piece of um, communication from God over thousands of years by many, many different voices and yet coherently the Word of God. There is a storyline, there is a, a biblical theology that it is worth understanding and that helps us to understand individual bits. Now you got to sufficiency, mm -hmm. when we get to sufficiency, I was, I was actually very surprised that you didn't start with 2 Timothy 3.16, yeah. but you started with the words of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, this is the this is my particular um, concern in that book. I'm going back Jesus. to Jesus, back to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Did Jesus think it was true? Yes, so clearly. Where, where do you get sufficiency from the words of Jesus? Well, when Jesus said, um, well, there's a wonderful parable which actually helps as much as anything else, the parable of um, the rich man and Lazarus, mm -hmm. where in the end um, the, the rich man is saying, you know, send somebody back to my brothers so that they won't, um, they won't come to this same place of torment that I've come, you know. Um, and um, Abraham says, they've got Moses and the prophets, let's let them listen to them. Oh no, Abraham, that's not enough. But if somebody goes from, um, you know, from the dead, comes back from the dead, then they'll listen. And the telling point at the end is if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they listen if somebody should come back from the dead. And I think the message of that um, parable is you had enough. The revelation you've got yeah, is yeah. sufficient. It was sufficient yeah. for you to do that. So when you talk about the sufficiency of the Bible, you've, got to say, you've always got to say sufficient for what? Mm -hmm. Is the Bible sufficient to show you how to live as God's person? Is it sufficient to train and equip somebody to be a servant of God? 2 Timothy 3. Now, I presume I heard this at Theological College, although <laughs> it's so long ago I'd forgotten, but yeah. you, you also unpack for us sufficient for each stage of biblical revelation. Yes. And that, uh, I'd forgotten that, <laughs> so give us that again. <laughs> in, in, indeed. What is told to the people of Israel... What, would it have been in my lectures 20 years I, ago? I would hope so. Because <laughs> right. I think I probably lectured you. <laughs> um, but uh, what, uh, what was revealed to Israel at Sinai was sufficient for Israel to live as the faithful people of God at that point. They didn't get all the all the um, fulfilment. I mean, they didn't the know promise. Isaiah was going to come. No, no, or they didn't know Isaiah. They didn't know Christ. Uh, yeah. They knew that God was the person they trusted to secure their future, and they knew promises that God had made, going back to the Garden of, of Eden, of course. But they don't have all of that information. But what they have is enough for the moment. And Moses um, uh, says to them, it's the theologian's great verse, actually, uh, the secret things belong to the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord your God, but the things that have been revealed uh, have been revealed to you and your children so that we might do all the works of this law. So he's given you enough for the moment. You don't need to know more at that point. God progressively expands on what he has made known about himself until you get the word made flesh in the New Testament. But it was not as if the Old Testament was disadvantaged. The Jewish people at the time of um, Moses were disadvantaged. No, they had what was sufficient for them to live as God's faithful people then. We are in a different situation. We now are on the other side of the cross, the other side of uh, the day of Pentecost, with the New Testament alongside the Old Testament. And what we have in the Bible is sufficient for living as a disciple of Jesus today. Efficacy was your fourth word. Indeed. And you immediately got into speech act theory and <laughs> just give me that in a nutshell. Oh yeah, um, because there's lots that's been thought about this. How, how effective is the Bible? How, how does it actually accomplish 
what it does. And speech act theory is just saying that God does things through words. Uh, put very simply, um, that he that that's words, more simply than all the articles <laughs> I've read. <laughs> it's really. I mean, God describes things with words. He makes promises with words. He warns with words. Um, all he, there are a range of different things that you can do with words. But God uses words to do things. So efficacy then says, does this does this word that God has given does it actually do what God call, says it will do? And you know, Isaiah 55, you know, um, no word will come from, uh, returns to me, no word that's come out of my mouth returns to me empty and void, but it will accomplish uh, what I called on it to do, what I've set it out to do. And you see that um, in the New Testament, the word of God is able to bring a difference. Peter preaches and people are brought to repentance. Lives are changed. Lives are changed. And today, um, the wonderful joy of being a pastor, isn't it, is of being able to share the word of life and see people come alive uh, and watch people who really did not understand what the gospel is or who God is suddenly know that they're loved, know that they're forgiven and rejoicing in new life as they walk as a disciple of Jesus. And you see that happening and say, the word of God works. Um, you kind of go next to the relationship between the word and the spirit and yeah. you and you say <coughs> inseparable which um i'm sure some people in wider christianity will be annoyed with you about. Oh, <laughs> i'm sure there were very big debates about this in the time of the reformation and there were debates about whether the bible is effective in and of itself or whether it's only effective as the spirit takes hold of it and uses it um, and in the end, I think I stand with people like uh, John Calvin and others who say, no, you've got to understand that it is the, the scriptures are the spirit's words. Uh, you cannot separate the word from the spirit. You don't read God's word, you know, hidden from God somehow behind God's back. No, when you engage the Bible, you're engaging the writer of the Bible who is present with you. And so you don't have to separate out, is the word doing it or is the spirit doing it? No, the word always uses the, the, the word is always attended by the spirit and the spirit always uses the word. Would you say the negative, the spirit then doesn't operate without the word? Um, I'm thinking it's very hard to see anywhere in the New Testament where you have that evidence of the spirit working apart from the word. Um, God is God and can do whatever, you know, that's the great thing about being God, you get to do whatever you like. Um, God is sovereign, and, but he is also consistent. Mm -hmm. And consistently in Old Testament and New, uh, the spirit and the word work together. Mm. And you actually linked it back to the very nature of the Trinity. Yeah, because in the end, you can't separate out the Son, the Spirit and the Father. Um, the, the work of the Son is also the work of the Father, is also the work of the Spirit. Thanks so much for coming in. <laughs> You've given us lots to think about. No, no, <laughs> it's been a joy. Thank you. The Doctrine of Scripture, an introduction. Uh, I said to Mark, I thought you should have called it um, those four big words. <laughs> yeah, but, right. uh, that would have frightened everybody off, yes. though, wouldn't it? <laughs> the Doctrine of Scripture, an introduction is the book. Mark Thompson is the principal of Moore Theological College in Sydney, and he has been our guest on The Pastor's Heart. We'll look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon.